Good evening and welcome to our opening reception lecture for Crafting America. My name is Janelle Redlazic and I'm head of our public programs team here at Crystal Bridges. It's an honor to welcome you all virtually for this conversation between the co-curators of the exhibition, Glenn Adamson and Jen Paget. Whether you're joining us here over Zoom or, tune, or tuning in on Facebook, we're thrilled to have this opportunity to bring the talk to an audience from all over the country. You can continue to meet us here on Zoom for more talks on our Crafting America series as we will be featuring a variety of online lectures with artists included in the exhibition in the coming months. This kicks off next week with a conversation between the legendary artist Joyce J. Scott and Dr. Leslie King Hammond, so be sure to mark your calendars. You can find more information about each talk on our website, including dates, times, and speakers. A few housekeeping notes. Throughout the talk this evening, we're going to encourage everyone to engage. So if you have a question or a comment, we will be collecting them using the Q&A button on Zoom. Or if you're tuning in from Facebook, feel free to write in the comment section. I also want to note that this program is being live captioned. If you're interested in utilizing this feature, you can turn on the captions by selecting the CC button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Tonight, I'm pleased to introduce co-curators of the exhibition, Crafting America, which opens to the public at Crystal Bridges tomorrow. The exhibition features over 100 works in ceramic, wood, fiber, glass, and metal, and more unexpected materials, and presents a diverse and inclusive story of American craft from the 1940s to today. Jen and Glenn will be giving you just a glimpse of the exhibition and the fabulous artists included. So if you are able to visit the museum, we hope you will come and see the work in person. Glenn Adamson is a curator and a writer who works at the intersection of craft, design history, and contemporary art. Many museums and cultural foundations have had the honor of having him serve as director, curator, and researcher. And he is currently senior scholar at the Yale Center for British Art. Jen Paget is an associate curator here at Crystal Bridges. Her research focuses on modern art from the 1900s to the 1950s, exploring connections between media and intersections between fine art and design. It is my pleasure now to welcome Glenn and Jen for this conversation. Thank you so much, Janelle. I have to say it has been such a pleasure to work with Janelle on this show in an extended way because she was the was she was the educator on the exhibition team so she's been a part of the development as we've gone along and it feels like such a wonderful uh, culmination moment albeit a strange one because we're doing it virtually and I think at the beginning of the project we might not have expected that but the way that our team has adapted and um, a special thanks to everyone who helped make this virtual exhibition possible. I think it's just a moment for us to celebrate the exhibition opening and I'm so pleased to have this opportunity to dive a little bit further into the themes of the exhibition and talk a little bit about the work. Um, before we do that I did want to say that one of the things that really distinguishes craft for me and is such a um, affirming and really exciting part of craft as a whole is how collaborative it is and Definitely during this exhibition, collaboration has been key. And there are so many individuals that contribute to it. So I just want to note a few of these. It's by no means exhaustive, but I have to say uh, the artists in the show, first of all, there are 98 artists in this exhibition, many of them living and working today. And it is a true honor to be able to present their work to our visitors. Um, we've also benefited from the amazing generosity of lenders, whether artists themselves, galleries, museums, private collectors, um, who are willing to part with their work for a period of time to have us have the ability to enjoy them. And when you see the works in person, you're going to wonder how uh, they allowed them to be rested away because they're so fantastic in person. Um, but they really made the show possible. I also want to say a note of thanks to our sponsors and especially the Wingate Foundation, our lead sponsor, who has championed the project and whose work really in the field of craft um, has made this exhibition possible. I also want to thank um, Blakeman's Fine Jewelry, Phillips and the Morris Foundation for their support and also um, amazing grants from the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities that just speak to the fact that so many people saw in this project something meaningful and something relevant to the moment. And without that support, of course, the show couldn't have happened. So many thanks to them. I also wanna say a word of thanks to all of the staff at Crystal Bridges 
from our exhibition core team to our education team to everyone that makes the exhibition possible. It really is a team effort and especially during um, the course of the last year when we have had so many unexpected hurdles or um, new opportunities for growth. Uh, it has been really fabulous to have this collective effort and to see people really believe in the show and problem solve and think creatively to make it all happen. Um, beyond that, our volunteers, our donors and members, our board chair and founder, Alice Walton, who's been an advocate for the project from the start and is just cheering us along the entire way. Um, the project wouldn't have been possible without so many individuals dedicating so much energy and so much passion to it. And it speaks to the power of the work that these artists are doing and just the impact that the show can have really broadly. I'll also say a word of thanks to um, four individuals who served as advisory members for the exhibition during its planning. And they also contributed to the um, exhibition catalog, which is a gorgeous publication. Um, they've written for that and offered feedback as we developed. And that would be Bernie Herman, Seth Brodney, Anya Montiel and Jenny Sorkin. And of course, if the exhibition were happening in person, we would all be toasting a glass together this weekend, but we'll have to just pause and hope for that in a later date. And at this moment, um, go ahead and embark on discussing the exhibition a little bit. And I, we had a PowerPoint ready if Megan doesn't mind pulling that up. Or if Glenn, if you have an introductory word you'd like to share. Well, thanks for uh, doing such a comprehensive job of thanking all the amazing people and institutions that have made this possible. Uh, you just left one out, which is Crystal Bridges. And I wanna thank obviously you, Jen, but everyone at Crystal Bridges. It's kind of funny for me because I've been working on craft as a topic and researching the area for, maybe I shouldn't disclose how long, <laughs> but, but more than two decades. And um, it's this funny thing, but I've actually never had the opportunity to help curate a large scale craft show. So this is really my first chance to do that. And it's been such a pleasure throughout to work together. And that's an interesting thing about the show is the breadth of it and the range. We should say it covers in terms of date about 80 years. It's roughly 1940 to present. And in terms of variety of artists, variety of media, just the ground that we cover is really unusual in the field. And it's kind of the first exhibition of this kind to take such a broad look and especially to focus on the diversity of craft and bring together works and artists that aren't always seen in combination. You can go to the um, next slide is just giving you a glimpse of the range of artists, diversity of artists, diversity of different kind of making and practice. And in the exhibition, we focus on the idea that craft is skilled making on a human scale. And this is just a snapshot of a few of the artists in the show and the idea that it could be in ceramics or in weaving or using something as simple as looping metal wire that you see craft practices broadly in these ways and bringing them together um, brings out a kind of richness and creates a dialogue across different channels that you might not expect. And we can go to the next slide. So, the kind of format that we have here for this discussion is that we're going to walk you through the exhibition and Glenn and I will go back and forth and tell you a little bit about the sections. Um, I included photography that is hot off the press, just taken by me in the galleries this morning. So uh, we wanted to give you a sense of the work that's in the show and also the space because there's something really special about seeing these works in person. So Glenn, do you want to take it away and talk a little bit about this introductory space? Yeah, sure thing, Jen. Thank you. Uh, so here we are in the first uh, section, which I suppose you could say is a little bit of exposition. A lot of people asked us while we were working on the show, well, Jen and Glenn, what do you mean by craft? Obviously, there are lots of potential definitions and interpretations of that word. Uh, so we decided to uh, create a first gallery that tried to answer that question. Uh, first of all, as you can see that definition there on the left hand side, that craft is skilled making on a human scale, as Jen just said, in other words, it's not factory production or manufacturing, obviously, but it does include a huge range of, um, of production, always involving the talent and long-term expertise of an individual or a team of people. And so um, having uh, made that definition, we then look at uh, several different particular qualities of craft or aspects of craft that can be brought out through the examination of specific objects. So if you go to the next slide, 
you'll see just um, a couple of examples. Um, this is our first juxtaposition uh, thing that people will see right when they come into the exhibition. And it shows two silversmiths side by side on the right, John Pripp, uh, the great um, exponent of Scandinavian modern uh, in this country who taught in Rochester, very influential on many, many other uh, craftspeople, including Myra Mimlich Gray, who actually studied with him, not in Rochester, but actually at the Haystack uh, School of Craft. And what's fascinating about these two objects is that one of them seems so orthodox, I suppose, and by the way, very beautiful um, in its proportion. Uh, it's sort of the kind of thing we expect craftspeople to make, perhaps. And then on the left, Myra Mimlich Gray's piece seems like a piece of conceptual art, perhaps, or almost like a magic trick. Um, it looks as if this teapot has been somehow melted into a puddle. But what's fascinating is that they were actually made using exactly the same skill set of hand raising. It's simply that Memlich Gray is using that skill in a very um, adventurous and unexpected manner to cre create this kind of trompe l'oeil effect. But still, we have skill being applied. The point being that, of course, craft can go in all sorts of unexpected directions. Uh, if you go to the next slide, um, we'll see uh, another example. Uh, next slide, please. There we go. Drum roll, please. Uh, Beatrice Wood and David Williams, senior. Uh, will we um, see perhaps a more symbolic application of the concept of craft, which we have interpreted under the heading of ritual. So there on the left, you see Beatrice Wood, the so-called mama of Dada, very uh, closely associated with Marcel Duchamp and the other avant-garde artists uh, of the early part of the 20th century lived a very, very long life, over 100 years, and um, along the way made an absolutely amazing, uh, prolific body of expressive pottery. Um, on the right, you see a feast bowl of zoomorphic form by an indigenous maker called David Williams. Um, what's uh, fascinating about this juxtaposition from our point of view is that it shows how symbolism and resonance and indeed spiritual value, which I think you can particularly um, sense from the uh, gorgeous undulating um, and rhythmic quality of the carving on the right, um, you, you get a sense that craft is a way of imbuing raw matter with a kind of intention and also with a kind of transcendence. And if you go to, on to the next slide, please. Uh, we'll step into the next room of the exhibition, which we've called Declarations of Independence. Now, as you'll uh, see, the main galleries of the show are organized in a tripartite manner, three parts, uh, that are called Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness, obviously a quotation from de the Declaration of Independence. Um, and we'll explain something of those sections as we go through. Uh, here virtually. But first, again, we wanted to, in a spirit of exposition and setting the stage, we wanted to really think about the way that craftspeople use their skills and use objects as a way of articulating a sense of autonomy, a sense of freedom, obviously a key American value. And um, also perhaps you might say a sense of aspiration, personal aspiration uh, that also can express community values. We often um, talked about the fact that craft could be a way for two different American, um, two different American principles, that of individuality, you know, the frontier spirit, um, sort of adventurism that one might associate with American history, with our deep sense of community and connection to one another. Craft is often the interface between those two uh, seemingly competing values. So uh, here in this, um, in this room, if you go to the next slide, please, uh, we have a range of artworks by um, art, artists from a diverse uh, range of backgrounds, uh, many of which seem to circulate around the idea of a flag or an emblematic object. Uh, textiles very much to the fore in this space, uh, also practices of the quilting, but also beadwork um, and weaving, as you can see here. The object on the right by Consuelo Jimenez Underwood is entitled Home of the Brave. And it has become something like the emblem of our exhibition in some ways. It's featured on the exhibition catalog that will be out in about a week or so. Um, and it, of course, presents itself as an American flag, but one that's been somehow transformed and reinvented, reimagined, you might say, with that strip of um, characteristic vernacular native or Mexican weaving at the bottom, also loose threads hanging from the, from the um, lower edge of the work as if this flag were unraveling or perhaps being raveled. So a sense of making and unmaking happening, a kind of dialectic of change 
or as I say, transformation. Um, and then on the left, we have Jeffrey Gibson's work in Numbers Too Big to Ignore. He'll be an artist that's well known to many of you. Uh, Gibson is a MacArthur winning artist, uh, widely recognized for his redeployment of uh, indigenous uh, traditions and materialities here, for example, beadwork and jingles, which are the metal uh, sounding elements from uh, performance costumes that might be worn in powwows or other, uh, other native uh, ceremonies. And here he's referring specifically this phrase in numbers too big to ignore uh, to, the, um, to the fact that so many Native American women have lost their lives to uh, a range of tragic circumstances having to do with, of course, the expansion of white settlement across uh, America during the 18th, 19th and 20th centuries and down to the present day. Um, but also I think he intends that phrase as often in his use of language um, to perhaps be multivalent. So something that could be interpreted in, in any number of ways. When we, think of, um, when we think of the quantity or the scale of a tragedy as finally arresting our attention, finally becoming too big to ignore, what does that perhaps say about the fact that we were ignoring it to begin with? Um, next slide, please. Um, another thing I'll just mention as we shift to the next image is that of course, abstraction is a very important aspect of uh, the works that we see in this uh, space. Quilting is often discussed and celebrated as being a kind of uh, incipient or historical pre-abstraction, so a kind of source for abstract painters in the 20th century. So certainly we see that in the two works that we uh, viewed in the last slide, also very evident in Ronald Lockett's powerful metalwork piece, which alludes to uh, textiles again, very much alludes to familial traditions, African-American traditions in the South, very um, vital traditions of quilt making, um, but also th this uh, particular uh, work is a kind of tribute to his grandmother and the flowers that sh she grew in her garden. Um, Lockett is somebody who in another exhibition context might well be described as a visionary artist or self-taught or outsider artist, all terms that have a kind of um, rich tradition of um, discussion and <laughs> debate around them. Um, but you know, one of the things that you'll see as we go through the exhibition is that we've put in artists, included artists, who might not normally be seen in a craft exhibition, or at least in the past, haven't necessarily been presented in that light, who aren't necessarily, for example, involved with the studio craft movement per se, but still are clearly working expressively with um, materials and processes that can readily be seen as skilled making and as um, not just human in scale, but also humane in affect. And then uh, finally, in this room, we have the powerful work of Gina Adams from her um, series, The Broken Treaty Quilt Cycle. Uh, what Adams is um, doing in these works is to transcribe the documents, the text from documents of treaties that were made between indigenous uh, nations, tribes, and the United States government, documents and agreements that were later transgressed by the United States. So this is really an act of historical uh, memorialization, a kind of um, anti-forgetting, you might say, bringing back these words into our uh, frame of awareness. And of course, as with so many of the works on view in the exhibition, the act of making is intended to, um, to place a sense of weight and importance and focus and attention on this historical, the set of historical facts. So it's, it's a, you could say that it's a kind of um, ideologically charged or symbolically charged use of craft. But although it's more explicit in this case than you might see in other parts of the show, I think really it would be right to say that every craftsperson when they invest their time and skill, hard won skill into the making of an object, one of the most important things they're saying is look at this, this matters. Uh, this is important, please attend to this particular history. Uh, so with that, I think we'll go on to the next section. And I'll hand it yeah, over that to transitioned yeah. So nicely, because it's exactly that idea of the connection between an individual's life and the work that they make being deeply interconnected. And that in the section that we move to life, that's something that becomes a really important sub theme. And the stories of makers in this section range from a number of um, people who are immigrants to the US, refugees fleeing Nazi persecution um, in the period leading up to and during World War II. And that's 
the case for Ani Albers, Gertrude Donato Knapfler, Marguerite Wildenhain, um, artists whose work is within the shot here, and that idea that that influx of individuals who came from both really rich traditions of European making, but also modernist thinking inspired by the Bauhaus and the notion that artistic production and modernist production should cross between different media and that you should have just as much attention and rigor and interest in abstraction and weaving as you would in painting is something that was hugely influential um, within the U.S. So that idea of how biography and these larger patterns in history have a really important kind of moment is certainly the case. It's also um, certainly true of thinking about the indigenous artists that we highlight in this section and that importance of how the continuance and survivance of indigenous culture was deeply connected um, to the lives of individuals and both passed down through many generations. That idea that the long carried languages of different materials and techniques was something that connects individuals both to their own kind of identity, but one that spans um, long into the past. And in this section, life is something that has many layers of meaning because we also um, focus on the idea that life is about craft within an everyday context and in the places and context of function and use that notion that everyone has a kind of connection to craft because of craft's um, deep legacy in use for creating functional objects and that notion of the vessel or textiles, furniture, things that surround us in everyday life. And in this section, really thinking about that and then looking at artists who draw upon those meanings as really deep metaphors in their work and then also expanding and pushing the boundaries and exploring abstraction um, through something like a vessel and the relationship between the interior and exterior. And if we go to the next slide, there's two great examples of this um, in the work of Gertrude and Otto Natzler, who I mentioned were refugees to the US. And we can um, head to the next slide. You'll see the monumental bowl that you catch a shot of um, in that picture is really impressive in person. It just is a huge and magnetic object because of this crater-like turquoise glaze that has a phenomenal texture. I mean, it's something that is really a highlight of this um, couple in which Gertrude would throw the forms, Otto would handle the glazing, and together and they created these really masterful works that show how artists push the kind of boundaries of thinking about vessel forms, of pushing the boundaries of um, ceramic in that case. Uh, and then we also have here a work by the artist Susie Billy. Um, she was a pomo basket maker and um, wove this remarkable basket, the delicacy of which you can really only sense in person because she's using um, bird feathers from mallard ducks that lend the really lovely kind of um, green tones to some of the darker sections and intermixing with other um, bird feathers and with shells and weaving them together into this willow basket, which is really a kind of showpiece of her skill. Um, for her and other Pomo basket makers, continuing in these craft traditions was a means to both economic stability, and she in particular was a member of a group that was called the Pomo Indian Women's Club, um, who basically formed a kind of group to set fair prices for their work, to do educational and cultural outreach, and um, during a period of time when living in California, there was a lot of um, discrimination against indigenous peoples. It was a form of really powerful, um, you know, ability to present their work, to continue these traditions, and to be able to include this is not only speaking to her skill, but also um, to the importance of those continuing traditions for the indigenous community um, altogether. Going to the next slide in this section, we, always, we also feature um, a really spectacular grouping of jewelry. And um, there's jewelry throughout the exhibition in a number of places. And in each case, it brings to the fore ideas about the relationship between craft and the body, craft and adornment. And in this grouping of five works, um, we have very different approaches to that. And these two works in particular are nice together because you see in the work of Mary Lee Hugh, who's on the left there, um, the idea of the fineness of 
technique of craft of using a precious material to create something that is beautifully decorative and really entrancing and looking at, at it in person you get that sense of the time that went into making it the detail and the intricacy and also the attention and um, to creating a really remarkable abstract pattern together it's something that would be a kind of highlight of adornment for the person wearing it that contrast is really um, nicely compared to a work by Ramona Solberg, which is also in this section, but instead of um, placing a remarkable gemstone or instead of a finely wrought piece of metalwork, um, as the centerpiece here, she's included a domino. And that idea that through looking to the materials of everyday life and incorporating found objects, you can make a piece of jewelry that speaks to experience and says something about contemporary American life that's meaningful, humorous, and then also um, playing on the idea of abstraction and that's something about that kind of tutu on the domino that's just really lovely that that's the piece that she chose. And as the center of this, you get that kind of off-center um, element to the pieces and seeing these in conversation, the idea that we're playing upon all the different approaches to jewelry and helping to map out some of the, the different ways in which artists um, use objects in their craft. Going to the next slide, um, as I mentioned, that idea of biography being really important is something that comes out in this section and works by George Nakashima and the artist Gentaro Kenneth Hikagawa. Nakashima is really renowned as one of the most important um, American studio furniture makers and somebody whose designs have a really iconic quality. You can see in the rocking chair here on the left, these really fine um, elements of wood across the back of the chair. And then that freeform arm where he's letting the organic and more rough edges um, really speak to the quality of the wood and to what he really saw as the spiritual um, power of the wood, that there was something that the artist was then um, tasked with bringing out, that it wasn't just about the artist using the material to realize a specific artistic vision that was preformed, but that it was in dialogue with the material in the kind of conversation and discovering the grain of the wood, specific burls or markings, but um, that determines the final outcome. Uh, the work of Hikigawa in conversation with Nakashima is really important because Hikigawa was actually um, the person who trained Nakashima in a number of the techniques of Japanese joinery. And this, the training between them happened when they both were incarcerated during World War II. Um, Hikugawa was an immigrant to the U.S. from Japan and Nakashima was a Japanese American immigrant and during this shameful chapter in U.S. history um, they were both forced from their homes and um, sent to live in the Minidoka um, internment camp during this period. Uh, Hikugawa created the dresser that you see here um, kind of in the center of the slide during that period using things like scrap wood um, and material that was scavenged from the surrounding location, which was very harsh. But those handles that you see are made of a grease wood or brushwood, um, the same kind that you see him working in a photo that's on the far right um, that was taken during this period in the camp. And it's that kind of moment in which these artists are under extremely harsh conditions, and yet there's this transmission of knowledge and information that goes on to be so formative in the history of American craft that to us was a really important story to bring out and to both uh, present the work of a really well-known um, furniture maker and one that's much less recognized, but really crucial to that history. Going to the next slide. Um, one of the really um, special moments in the show is a room in which we've installed the work by Sonia Clark titled The Beaded Prayers Project. And you walk into this space and on all four walls surrounding you, there are these two foot by two foot panels and to each is attached a number of these little beaded pouches. And I just took a snapshot of just one of the little details in this section. You can see somebody's decorated this pouch with a little frog kind of figure. Um, and Sonia Clark has invited more than 5,000 people to contribute to this project over the life of, um, you know, it's been now more than 20 years that it's been ongoing. 
what she does is invite people to take a slip of paper, write onto it a hope or a prayer. Um, don't let anyone see it, but then enclose it into a little pouch and then decorate the surface of the pouch with a bead or with many beads or just from this little snapshot you can get the sense of there's a kind of creativity that each person who contributes to the project brings to it. So in being invited to participate to this one person's wish becomes part of a much larger kind of collective dreaming and hoping and in the project she also encourages people um, to create a kind of twin to create an additional um, beaded pouch which they then keep. So in this installation, one of the things that you get is that sense of personal identity and the creative energies of individuals that then come together in this larger moment. And it speaks so much to the idea that craft is something that has that collective and has that generative and even that kind of healing power. She did a number of workshops following um, the attacks of September 11th in 2001. And there's something really beautiful and meaningful about people in that moment of need and in that moment of pain, having that kind of collective expression. And that's something that um, you feel very powerfully when you're in this space, because even though you're not made um, aware or you're not privileged to know what's written on these slips of paper, um, there's a kind of resonance there and it speaks really beautifully to that quality. Um, you can go to the next slide. So yeah, uh, this is a transition to, to Glenn to, to the next section of the exhibition. Yeah, thank you, Jen. Um, so from that uh, powerful statement of communal identity and communal hope, uh, we, in a way, go back to the, the pendulum swings again, and we go back to the extremes of individualism and expression that craft is capable of, starting um, with this group of powerful works from the 1950s and 60s. Um, which are by, um, if you go to the next slide, please, by Sheila Hicks, uh, Peter Volkus, Eleanor Tawney, and then there was also a work by John Mason there on the right-hand side of that previous slide. So this is a section of the uh, exhibition that we've called Liberty. And of course, it is about the principle of uh, freedom and particularly the um, kind of uh, complicated, maybe even paradoxical way that um, embracing the strictures of craft, the particular qualities of materials, which of course exert a lot of friction on people that try to work with them. You know, there are some things fiber and clay and glass uh, can do, and some things that are not so easy to do with them. So by adopting one of these materials as their own, what you often find is that artists are able to create uh, a kind of monumentality or expressive vocabulary that would otherwise be unavailable to them. And that's certainly true of the three great figures that we see here. Uh, so Sheila Hicks there on the left, using the uh, visual imagery of braiding and using a very simple technique of wrapping. So wrapping a series of colored threads around these loose skeins of, um, of yarn to create this rhythmic, um, somewhat minimal, but also extremely rich polychromatic um, visual experience. You might think about uh, comparing a work like this to let's say the work of Donald Judd um, and the way that the difference in the materiality between Judd's you know, industrial quality metal uh, can be juxtaposed to the softness, the pliancy, the openness, and of course the allusion to, um, to feminine history, a, a kind of implicit feminism in a work like that on the left. In the middle, we have Peter Volkus, an artist I'm particularly interested in, and I was able to uh, co-curate an exhibition at the Museum of Arts and Design about Peter Volkus a few years ago. Um, this is a particularly important work of his called Rondena uh, that dates from 1958, a moment that he was really hitting his stride and breaking through into his most important uh, large scale work. As you can see in that last uh, image, this is an extremely uh, significant object in terms of its sheer scale. It's about six feet tall. When initially made uh, before it was fired, it probably would have weighed well in excess of a ton. So he's manipulating a tremendous amount of clay and um, really muscling it into this kind of torqued uh, extremely uh, powerful visceral shape. So this is really very much in dialogue with abstract expressionism, which of course is still in full flow in America at that time. Also maybe even more importantly in this case, in dialogue with cubism, artists like Picasso and Brock. And you can see how uh, Volkus is using color on the surface of the uh, ceramic, um, uh, uh, the ceramic sculpture to try to break up and destabilize 
that volume, the kind of envelope of the work. So it's entirely made of traditional ceramic materials, you know, iron slip, cobalt, stoneware, all the stuff you'd make uh, traditional functional pottery out of, but obviously it's been elevated into this totally new um, and extremely ambitious uh, purpose. And then on the right, we have Lenore Tani, uh, who I also had the honor to work on uh, for an exhibition at the Kohler Art Center a couple of years ago. And this is a wonderful example of her woven forms, which is a kind of a lexicon that she developed in the very early 1960s. Um, a little complicated to describe, particularly if like me, you're not a weaver, but basically what she did was to engineer a way of working on the loom where she could move the warp threads, which are the vertical threads that go up and down in the finished composition and move them stepwise out and in, which gave her that ability to create a kind of telescopic or as she described it, almost like a breathing uh, dynamic and a rhythm to the work. And again, this is a very, very large scale object, much taller than a person. Um, and you can imagine it, you know, she was very interested in meditation, very interested in spirituality. And you can imagine that, that uh, sculpture hanging from the ceiling so ethereally, almost as if it were descending from heaven, almost as a physical breath, like it was just inhaling and then letting the breath out again, again, as you might in meditation, in fact. Um, and she often would think of these things as being river-like, as being like the flow of the East River outside of her studio in Coenty Slip in Manhattan. Uh, if we could go on to the next, uh, next image, we'll encounter another of the truly great figures of post-war uh, craft. And that of course is Wendell Castle. You can see the piece there in the installation shot on the left, just next to Hicks and Volkus. This is a really important uh, transitional piece of his uh, that, you know, it almost it literally depicts the idea of transition uh, for furniture from something recognizable and familiar, boxy, uh, very much, you know, in the kind of standard Danish modern style that would have been uh, encountered in the typical sort of upscale living room uh, of the day uh, to something wholly unexpected, sculptural, uh, organic. And so what Castle did very ingeniously, I think, is to create this series of tendrils. They're almost like roots or perhaps tentacles that seem to grow up from the ground into the object and then actually serve as the drawer pulls so I hope you can see on the slide that there are a little uh, interruptions in those vertical curved elements, and they actually are simply the handles to the drawers. So a kind of very uh, canny um, rethinking of a very, you know, uh, again, a, a very familiar furniture form. And of course, what would happen after this, um, this was made in 1962, as I said, what would happen after this is that Castle would develop techniques of uh, lamination that allowed him to sculpt freely in space, totally rethink uh, furniture forms in a much more sculptural direction. Uh, next slide will uh, show us another person rethinking uh, traditional craft uh, to extremely innovative ends. And this is Ruth Asawa, whose work you can see in the installation shot on the right in uh, dialogue with um, the equally wonderful work of Francoise Grossan. But I'm gonna talk um, a little bit uh, now about Asawa um, who, you know, if you've heard of one artist in, in the show, it might possibly be her because she's been on a postage stamp, <laughs> US postage stamp recently. She was also a Google Doodle on her birthday last year. Um, and that shows how truly celebrated and recognized she is now. But let me tell you, that was not always the case. Um, she was very much sidelined, like so many of these other artists, marginalized because in her case of being a woman, an Asian American, and also working in uh, what was then a marginalized technique. Uh, what she's doing here, um, if you're not familiar with the work, is to create these abstract volumes that are nested inside of one another. They're simply made by looping wire. So very, very simple technique that she actually was inspired to take up by seeing it uh, used to make vernacular baskets in Mexico. Um, but obviously she, she um, really you know, rethought it entirely and in dialogue with other artists working in the fiber art movement like Lenore Tani, who's uh, you know, similarity to this uh, work you can perhaps see, um, she created this kind of rhythmic, um, perhaps somewhat constructivist uh, sculptural language. Also might be worth saying that Asawa was um, very importantly for her, able to study at Black Mountain College briefly uh, with the likes of Annie Albers and Joseph Albers, you know, in the years that Volkus 
John Cage, Rausenberg, uh, and many other significant figures of the American avant-garde uh, were teaching or studying there. So you can see, again, that kind of uh, progressive energy in her work. Uh, now, if we go on to the next slide, we can see a couple of contemporary works that are in this section. Obviously, craft materials and intelligently deployed processes still to this day remain an absolutely critical um, you know, animating force behind contemporary art. And here are uh, two examples of that. On the left, the work of Arlene Sheckett, and on the right, uh, a new acquisition for Crystal Bridges by the artist Diedrich Brackens. Um, what Sheckett is doing um, is working in a range of materials. She's very well known for her work in ceramic, but has equally been working in uh, painted wood uh, and uh, metal and other materials of late. And this is a fascinating um, sculpture, which is actually made by using some pieces to cast and imprint other pieces. So it's a work that's literally in conversation with itself. It's almost being used as a tool to fabricate itself or like a machine of unending creativity, which Arlene, um, if, if, if you knew her, you would definitely say she seems to be, um, just incredible sculpture pouring out of her um, at, at high velocity. And she really is you know, one of our greatest uh, American sculptors at the moment, very much an inheritor of um, traditions of abstraction that began with Brancusi and come right down to the present. Diedrich Brackens uh, works in the medium of weaving. And as you can see, um, has a, a rather loose and evocative way around his material, often uses iconography that's very suggestive, even mythic, you might say. So here a black figure um, with a, a snake or again, vine or tendril wrapped around um, his form, uh, seeming like something from legend. And a lot of what uh, Brackens is doing has, has to do with thinking through folk narratives and you know music and other um, sources, particularly from African American history, and really um, developing a highly personal language uh, with those sources. And it's just another way of thinking around this question of individuality and expression that we explore in this liberty section. Um, now, if we go into the next slide, um, we'll accelerate into the finale of the exhibition and the last section, which is called The Pursuit of Happiness. Here, I think it's important to note that these values that we um, have abstracted from the Declaration of Independence, you know, through the citation of the phrase life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, we did that very much realizing that those are aspirational goals, you know, foundational values of the country that are not necessarily always realized in practice. And that would certainly be the case with the idea of the pursuit of happiness, you know, given that this, the Declaration of Independence was written when a very large percentage of the population was enslaved. Um, obviously, that was not, um, that was not a, an opportunity that was being afforded to them whatsoever. And so we wanted to think in this last section, certainly about imagination um, and about the sheer kind of exuberant, um, frankly, fun that craft can generate. Um, it's a little bit small, but there you see, for example, a guitar that was made by a custom um, luthier guitar maker called Dave Roussan. Um, it's called the Cloud Guitar, and it was originally made for the uh, famous musician Prince. Um, so, you know, some unexpected um, examples in this section. But if you go to the next slide, um, we also wanted to um, highlight some of the complexity of objects that might initially seem to be rather straightforward. Uh, so, for example, in the Anne Lemansky sculpture on the left, we see a tiger balancing on a ball as might be encountered in a circus. And so your initial impression is that this is, um, you know, a, a, an amusing um, and kind of entertaining object and certainly absolutely extraordinary in terms of the way that it's made. Very, very finely rendered uh, cut paper pattern, uh, particularly on the tiger. Um, but then you think about the motif and you realize that, you know, what she's doing is really um, getting at the poignancy of this animal situation, the strangeness of it being expected to, you know, perch up there on this extremely, you know, treacherous um, and uncertain uh, foundation. And it might in fact be offered in some ways as a, as a kind of metaphor for a kind of uncertainty or precariousness in a more general way. So very psychologically rich. And I would say the same thing for Judy McKee's work, a, a, you know, wonderful and important furniture maker from New England um, who has this really, in extraordinary sense of line and composition. Here you can see how she's used these two monkeys to create the armrests in the back for this piece of furniture. But there's also something really stately and ceremonial about it. it almost seems like a kind of domestic throne and has a real kind of presence or gravitas 
uh, despite its accessibility and, and appeal. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so uh, just getting towards the, the last part of the show here, uh, we have this fantastic platform uh, that shows uh, performance costume and fashion together. Many of you will recognize Nick Cave there on the left. Uh, in the middle, we have the fashion design of the um, native uh, California maker, um, Jamie Okuma. And on the right, we have um, one of the true showstoppers of the exhibition, Daryl Montana's uh, uh, performance suit um, for the Mardi Gras. And um, you know, this is a great example. I saw we had a question earlier on about some of the more unexpected examples of craft and different techniques and materials that we have in the show. And this is certainly qualify as one. It's probably not something most people would expect to see in a craft survey, but I would defy anybody to look at this object and not understand it as being very beautifully crafted. And of course, it's also a very complex object in terms of its cultural layering, having to do with the exchange of um, identities and sort of communication through objects between African-American communities and Native American traditions down there in Louisiana. Uh, now, if you go on to the uh, next slide, um, we see another installation shot of the last uh, part of uh, Pursuit of Happiness. And if you go to the next slide still, um, we see the work of Linda Lopez on the left. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we'll see the work of Linda Lopez on the left, Arkansas's own, uh, teaches ceramics at the University of Arkansas. Uh, beautiful kind of lush object with gold um, interspersed into this, uh, this very delicate, uh, very highly worked surface. And on the right, equally highly worked, the uh, work of Ebony Patterson. Um, and this is really a perfect example of what we were trying to get at and thinking through this idea of the pursuit of happiness, um, because her work is really intended as a kind of um, commemoration or memorialization um, often of uh, people who have met a violent end um, in, you know, either in her native Jamaica or elsewhere. She thinks a lot about uh, roadside shrines that are uh, set up for people who have been lost in these kinds of violent incidents. And of course, thinking also about the incredible ornamental energy of those, uh, of those visual experiences as well as the tragedy that underlay them and motivated them to, to come into existence. And so it's a really appropriate um, ending for the show. Uh, we were actually amazed, um, floored really to discover when telling Ebony uh, that her work would be in this uh, part of the show, that she actually had the phrase uh, pursuit of happiness tattooed on her arm, um, complete coincidence, but it, I guess we felt like we were onto something <laughs> when we found that out. Now, um, that's the end of the show in the temporary gallery, but um, it's not actually the end of the show at Crystal Bridges because if you go to the next slide, Jen is just going to tell you about a couple of installations that we have elsewhere in the museum. And then we'll take your questions. Such a great visual shift from Ebony and Linda's work to a totally different space and also idea of time. Uh, because one of the things that we wanted to do with this exhibition is reinforce the fact that craft is integral to American art, that it's not just something that's taking place in the temporary galleries, but it's something that has a presence and a life throughout the institution. And to have a special opportunity and um, to highlight that in two spaces is just phenomenal. And the first is in our early American galleries with a new work that um, was specially commissioned um, by Crystal Bridges and is a new acquisition to the collection. And this is um, the work Belongings by Beth Lippman. Um, Beth is based in Wisconsin and works largely in the medium of glass and often does works that respond to histories of still life painting and to the idea of excess, the idea of um, decay, uh, the idea of extravagance, um, but also really the notion of memory and especially how objects have a place in continuing memory, in offering opportunities to have access to history or in some cases obscuring. So she visited Crystal Bridges and had a chance to see the collection and from that was really attracted to the series of portraits um, of the Levy Franks family, which is a colonial era set of portraits and really centers around the matriarchal figure, Abigail Levy Franks. And Beth, in thinking about these portraits, thought about the idea of what histories are accessible to us through these paintings. What do we know about the lives of these individuals through their letters, archives, the materials that we have, and the research that she did into the family and into Abigail, um, all 
goes into this work, which is a glass travel trunk. And within the travel trunk, which is illuminated from beneath, there's a variety of objects that Beth has also made. Um, some of them glass, some of them clay, um, some of them sand that's meant to evoke the idea of gunpowder. And each object has a special resonance with something relating to um, either the individual identity of Abigail, but then more broadly thinking about colonial society and um, histories of cultural and ethnic um, identity, and then really thinking about what is kept, what is the treasure, what are the things that are passed down. And within the gallery space, it just has a fantastic presence because it's really glowing within this room of largely um, paintings from the 18th and 19th century. So um, that is in our early American galleries and something that I know that we're gonna continue to be able to unravel these kind of rich conversations around. And then the other objects that are um, in our uh, contemporary galleries, if we go to the next slide, um, features the artist Toshiko Takeizu. And here you can see the works of Takeizu who was largely um, active in ceramics, although she also um, worked in painting and weaving and a variety of other materials, but really um, her main focus and the area where she really shines um, is in ceramics and these closed forms, which um, some of these are quite towering. They're a little bit over five feet and have these really rich and um, wonderfully um, marvelous surfaces in which she's approached the decoration of these three-dimensional figures, almost like a painting in the round. And here it's in conversation with works by um, a number of post-war abstract painters in the Crystal Bridges collection. That includes Helen Frankenthaler, um, Joan Mitchell, Grace Hardigan, and there are a couple paintings that are not visible in these shots by Felrath Hines and also Mark Roscoe. And that idea that this conversation between um, painting and ceramics around the language of gesture and abstraction and the layered veils of color is something that's really powerful. And this is how um, her work has been on view um, in some other contexts, like the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston had a great installation of her work in conversation with abstract paintings. Um, and also the Yale Art Galleries has featured her in these kind of similar conversations. But in terms of the scale, being able to show this number of works and this size with these real stars of um, post-war painting is just an absolute knockout in the galleries and opens to all these conversations around expressive gesture across media. So an enticement to go visit the rest of the Crystal, Br Crystal Bridges galleries when you're visiting Crafting America to think about the place of craft within American art, not as something that's separate, but as something that really infuses it. I'm um, going to the next slide. There's one other space of engagement that we should mention because one thing that we've discovered during the planning of this project is of course, everyone has a connection to craft and everyone has a great craft story. And in conjunction with this exhibition, we developed a virtual project to gather those craft stories. And if you go to the exhibition webpage, there's a link where you can both read things that have been submitted and also contribute your own. We've asked people to submit an image and a short description, no more than a thousand characters, but something that captures what makes that craft object meaningful to you. Is it something that was passed down through your family? Is it something that you yourself made? Um, and I have to say just from the responses that we've gained so far, there are so many powerful stories around these objects that just make you appreciate the power of craft to connect individuals and also recognize the long lives of objects, that they really take on a kind of animate quality and they pass through these different situations that just are in some cases really surprising, really refreshing. Some of them are very sad and mournful and some of them are very hopeful. Um, and I think the hopeful side is definitely the kind of larger portion of that, that idea that through craft, through making, there's a sense of that deep humanity and the things that connect us. So. If you have a great craft story, we do want to hear. So join us at the website. You can um, head, get the link to this project there. And um, we're just excited to see how people contribute as the exhibition goes along. And these are just some of the photos that have been submitted so far. So 
Glenn, I think that we've left just a little bit of time for questions. Is that right? And I see that the question and answer um, feature has been quite active here. Yeah. So we can go ahead and exit the PowerPoint if um, we're, we'll, we'll see if anybody has anything that references images, but um, we'll go ahead and pass over to our question and answer. Yeah, okay. So um, first I'm just gonna, um, go ahead and answer a couple of super quick questions because they're uh, factual. So one question was, uh, what is Ronald Lockett's piece made from? And the answer is it's made from found uh, sheet metal. Um, and so he, he's using a kind of found object strategy there that, and it's then painted. So you're looking at a metal object, not a textile one. Um, question about Sonia, Sonia Clark's uh, beaded prayers. Um, does anybody ever open the pouches and read what is written in them? Answer no. Um, so part of the uh, ethos of the piece is that these hopes or prayers or wishes are private and they stay that way. So as I think Jen explained, uh, when you participate in the workshop, you write two versions of the uh, prayer, make two pouches, you take one with you as a kind of keepsake or totem and one joins the um, exhibition, but it will never be read. So it's very much um, a kind of personal or, or secret, um, secret uh, statement. Uh, Roderick Karakoff asks, was there a Ben Venom quilt next to the guitar? Answer, yes. The wonderful work of Ben Venom, uh, again, quilting, but drawing on the aesthetics of heavy metal and uh, motorcycle culture. Um, and I have to put in a plug because he is one of the artists that will be featured in conversation in a program that's upcoming in just a few weeks. So um, do be sure to join if you wanna hear more about his practice from, from the artist himself. Yeah, great. So, um, then we have some uh, questions that might take a little longer to answer. <laughs> some of them might take years if we were to do it properly, but we'll do our best here. Um, so one question is, please tell us how the exhibition relates to Glenn's book. Thanks for asking. Uh, I have just published a book that's called uh, Craft and American History. It's so just out from Bloomsbury, not the exhibition catalog and not to be confused with the exhibition catalog, although the titles are a little similar. Exhibition catalog will be out next week from uh, University of Arkansas Press. Uh, my book actually covers the period from the American Revolution to the present, whereas this exhibition covers 1940s to now. And that relates to our next question, which Jen, I'd love you to answer, from Albert Leikoff, the founder uh, and executive director emeritus of the Center for Art and Wood in Philadelphia, asks, why did you start the exhibition from the 1940s? Jen. That is something that we had so many conversations about because it's so hard when you put a point on something that then you realize, oh, but we might be excluding this from further back. And for us, it was really all of the things that are happening during that period that feed into what the larger themes and stories of the exhibition are. So um, the immigration of artists from Europe, the founding of schools and training programs um, by those artists and others, the legacy of Black Mountain College, um, the incarceration of Japanese Americans, the changes that are happening during that period that then um, really act as a kind of um, fuel to the development of innovative ways and thinking about the relationship between craft and expression and really the things that enhance that story that we were telling in the exhibition. Um, we were thinking also of the kind of more classic legacies of telling the story of American craft and the idea that it's really often connected to the um, development of post-war programs and the GI Bill and the funding and training that went into um, craft practices at that moment. And we wanted to both recognize that, but then also think a little bit broader because sometimes that narrative can be um, exclusionary and leave out really important things. So we were both referencing the fact that often that moment of really 1949 and then into the 50s and 60s kicked off so much of what is the American um, modern craft movement um, that all led us to think that that was the right moment to start in terms of story, but then also that we expand um, what we consider in that. Okay, so then we have a few questions unsurprisingly about definitions. Uh, so the questions about the relationship between craft and design, interior design, arts and crafts, fine art. Um, I'm just gonna answer that in as quick a way as I possibly can by going back to that idea of um, our definition being skilled making at human scale. So one thing you'll notice about that definition is that it really doesn't tell you skilled making of what. So it's very open-ended. And the point there really is that um, craft is a very um, concrete thing because it involves 
tools. It involves knowledge and expertise. It usually involves time and effort, um, kind of performance of the skill. Um, but what you then make of the object probably says as much about you as about the maker. So whether you choose to categorize something as fine art or design or decorative art, some other category, that probably is quite relative to different audiences, different times and places, different cultures, but craft is actually um, pervasive throughout all those different interpretive uh, situations. Um, so, you know, it's, it's sort of a, an embrace of the idea of craft as a verb, not as a noun or a, or a strict category. Um, and then Jen, I wanna get onto this really important question that we're getting, which is essentially around the um, politics of some of the choices that we made. Uh, so this is actually an anonymous attendee and it's a long question. So I'll just sort of highlight a couple of features of it. So they ask, is it empowering to non-white artists to highlight their strife? Would non-white curators feel empowered to include work that is quote harder than say a Sheila Hicks hanging and then uses the Ronald Lockett example. Um, and also the example of Hikigawa's uh, chest made in, a, uh, in the uh, internment camp and asks, would a Japanese American curator have included that dresser? Would they see it as pandering? So that seems like an important question to address. Um, do you want to tackle it first? And maybe I could also say a, a few things about that. Yeah, I think it's a good question. And whenever you have a topic that's as broad as ours, those questions of what is included and what is not is really um, important and something that is certainly subject to a lot of conversation as we were developing. And also um, the, the idea that there might be things that are excluded that we just didn't have the ability to tell the fullness of these stories is something that we thought about a lot during the process. And in some ways, this is about a kind of catalyst for thinking about craft at the institution. And there's other moments that we'll be able to bring out more of those studies uh, or more of those kind of moments to focus on these different stories. Um, but specifically that idea of uh, some of the choices about things like the Hikogawa and Nakashima, that I do think that is a kind of story that is deeply important and relevant to tell. And that for a lot of the choices that we made in the exhibition, we were having really involved conversations with colleagues across the field and with our advisory board members and took into account a broad range of perspectives in deciding what was included and what wasn't. And I think that um, in the question, there is that sense of um, perhaps there was a thing about struggle or um, something related to the idea that Lockett was somebody who worked under harsher conditions. And I think that for artists across all different kinds of backgrounds, we highlight different kinds of work for those, that it's not just that artists from a specific kind of racial or ethnic background are um, seen as being either suffering or struggling in some way, and some others are privileged, but we really have such a range. And I think when you see the show, you see artists that um, find success sometimes, you know, in the face of very difficult conditions, but their life was not about the difficulty of that struggle. It was about the really remarkable communities that they formed around them, um, the creativity and the opportunity that they found through craft. And I'm thinking of a figure like Doyle Lane, who worked within a community of really supportive um, artists and community in, uh, in California and somebody who found all these opportunities to do commissions and to do different projects. And so I would say that the idea of categorizing people according to their racial or ethnic background in the show is something that we we don't do. We don't say that any specific group of makers is categorized in any way, but really looking at each as an individual and thinking in the broadest terms around diversity about how to bring those together and show um, and really reflect the kind of diversity within the country and the circumstances people have faced. Yeah, uh, I might just say, um... Well, certainly just echo what Jen is saying, which is that if you're telling the history of anything, you want to acknowledge the tragedy as well as the more uplifting positive aspects of the story. And certainly in the case of Hikigawa's chest, which incidentally is on public display, you know, it is, it's not that we'd got it out of a bedroom <laughs> somewhere, you know, it's, it's on public display anyway. So um, perhaps that emboldened us to decide to include it um, because of and course- And I'll say one thing, I was yeah. gonna, I just forgot to mention this about the Hikugawa, of course, that we were in contact with the artists' um, living relatives, and they were just thrilled and very excited about having the work included in the show. And that was something that was important to us as well, that if there were questions, to be reaching out to the people that had um, agency and had a stake in this. So I don't know if that 
um, if that person is tuning in because of course they were invited this evening. <laughs> um, but that was something that along with the kind of ethical considerations we certainly thought about. Sorry, I interrupted you, Glenn. Well, I was just going to say, you know, something about the way Higagawa is, is actually extracting the opportunity for making beauty out of the most horrendous of circumstances. That is certainly something that we wanted to share with people um, while also being aware of the difficult decisions around, around that kind of inclusion. And I, I will say it was also just very important, not just um, that case, but to have, you know, our advisors and many others who consulted with us over the course of making the exhibition from a number of different backgrounds. So uh, we certainly didn't do it alone, that is for sure. We always say craft is a work of many hands, and that was certainly true of the exhibition as well. Um, Jen, we only have a couple of minutes, so maybe we can take a couple of the simpler questions. One is essentially, it's from uh, artist Laura Petrovich Cheney um, up in Boston. Um, saying, this is so wonderful to see two curators coming together. It un underscores that your theme of community. Were there any pieces that you had to compromise on in the selection of the work? So essentially, did we disagree about anything? <laughs> so do you want to talk about that? Gosh. Let me think about pieces that we might have, you know, I think that we both brought our own perspectives to it, but the working process was so collaborative and the way that in thinking really about the conversation between objects, one of the things that's so interesting about the show is when you're in the space, seeing how they interact with each other and sometimes um, in unexpected ways, things that you wouldn't expect to be brought together, I think reflects that idea that as we were putting the show together, anything was kind of fair game, anything was up for conversation. We certainly um, at some point had to say, we can't include this work because it doesn't quite fit so well, even though it's something that one or the other of us would be passionate about um, and just are wholly in favor of. So I would say that when I think about compromise, I, I can't think of anything that we really had to go to the mat to say that this was in because so many of the kind of meetings of the things that we were talking about fit, fit so fluidly together. But maybe Glenn, you have something that you are thinking about that you <laughs> remember, like the compromise, that's a really good question. Well, I think, it, it, you know, if one hasn't curated a show before, you, you know, the thing to say is that you always have way more material than you can fit. And so the difficult decisions tend to be about, it's like, you know, it's all, it almost feels like you're carving stone into a shape because you have, you know, a large number of objects on a wall and you're literally moving things around, taking them on, putting them off. So I wouldn't say, I mean, it's not really a disagreement situation. It's like a joint difficult decision that you're helping one another make the decisions essentially. And again, our advisory board was really crucial in that, in that, um, you know, Bernie and Anya and Seth and Jenny were really helpful to us in making a lot of those calls. Um, okay, um, I'll just sort of um, wrap up with two last questions from Bryna Pomp and Kayla Noble. So Kayla Noble is asking about indigenous practices and how that helped us shape our definition of craft and combating the whitewashing and dialogue around craft, which is certainly one of our key objectives as we've been talking about. And then Bryna, the great jewelry curator from New York, um, asks, do you feel that the major themes in the exhibition are very intrinsically American? And how would you compare what was being made in American craft during these decades to what was being made in Europe? Um, Jen, do you have any thoughts about the kind of Americanness of Crafting America of our show? Yeah, I think we had lots of conversations about that as well, because there's both a sense in the development, how it connects so much to things that are going on globally, and that idea that both in reference to particular traditions and histories of especially with European artists that is an important part of the show, but also recognizing that it's not something that's completely unique to um, the US, the idea that craft is something that really spans across the whole of, of human making is something that makes me want to say, it's not uniquely American, but there is something in this show that is about the way that craft has been so deeply tied to specific moments in history. And I think that this is something, Glenn, that you get to really beautifully in your book, that as a nation, that sense of the making, the formation, that there is a really interesting kind of parallel process and the moments at which you see that connection between the actual act of craft in terms of um, hand making something and the processes that we kind of focus on in the show and that active nation building and the idea of the kind of identities that come together in that in terms of sheer variety, I think does make a really strong case for why this is something that does have a special kind of resonance within the American context. Yeah. What do you yeah. say, Glenn? 
Very well said. Um, I guess the only thing I would add to that very quickly is that there's also just this amazing thing about craft that it's both saturated in pragmatism and also totally about symbolism. And if you think about Native American craft, which um, um, one of the questions was about, you know, that the, the sense of indigeneity and authenticity that one is often projecting or has often been projecting onto Native crafts turns out to be a deep in misunderstanding because of course Native artisans are um, inventing wildly and constantly as a way of negotiating the situations that um, they're finding themselves in or that they create for themselves. Uh, and we think about Maria Martinez, for example, and our show would be a great example of that. Um, so I think the, the key thing for us is to understand that not only are there particular formations of craft in America because of the history of the country, which is of course a very unique history having to do with um, native populations, immigrant populations, wave after wave of immigrant populations, certain political aspirations that we've been talking about, um, but it's also a way that uh, the country talks to itself about itself and communities talk to themselves about themselves. It's really just as much um, a matter of representation and identity as it is a matter of making things that you can drink your coffee out of in the morning, but it's also making your coffee cup. So it's, it's both those things all the time simultaneously. And I think that's one of the things that makes it perpetually fascinating. So I think we better draw it to a close there. Uh, thanks, Jen, for this. This is really fun. And thanks everyone for listening. So many friends out there. It's been great to share this time with you virtually.